I'd like to welcome you again, my brothers and sisters, JCC Sunday School in session. Yes, brothers and sisters, Sunday School matters to God, so Sunday School should matter to us as well. Our Sunday School lesson for January 12, 2020 will come from the text of 1 Kings, the 8th chapter, verses 14 through 21. We'll be teaching from two different Sunday School books as they all have the same text but different subjects. The Sunday School books with their perspective lesson topics are as follows. Towson Press, based on the International Lesson Series, its topic for this Sunday is Solomon's Speech. Finally, the last, in the, the last one is the Uniform Series of International Bible Lessons for Christian Teaching, and the title for this is Solomon Speaks to the People. We will provide a life application at the end of this lesson. I hope that you stick around to get it. Now, again, as always, I like to teach from our lesson today using context, observation, interpretation, and application. Let's begin with context. The faithful God of Israel had established David's son, Solomon, on the throne of Israel and enabled him to complete the project his father had given him, which was to build a house of worship for the Lord, God Almighty. We learned last week that they processed the Ark of the Covenant into the temple and then the glory of the Lord filled the temple, indicating God's presence among his people. Our lesson today will pick right up after that uh, event. And we will see after that the presence of the Lord filled the temple. Today we're going to deal with Solomon addressing the Lord and the people of God. There's much to glean from this lesson today as we notice what Solomon says in his speech. Our first part of the lesson we will see the blessings pronounced by Solomon. Solomon's speech begins with the blessings from the king. And in uh, verses 14 and 15, it reads, And the king turned his face about and blessed all the congregations of Israel. All the congregations of Israel stood. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which spake with his mouth unto David, my father, and half with his hand fulfilled his great saying. First thing we observe is that the king's speech is, is it, it, the first thing that we observe in the king's speech is that he turns to bless the people. Oh, what a feeling that could be, my brothers and sisters. Think about that. When someone who is in authority turns around during a special time, a special dedication, a special moment like this, and in their speech, they lay a blessing on you. I could only imagine that this was a great feeling as they stood there knowing their leader was pronouncing a blessing on them. Let's not take for granted this, my brothers and sisters, that everyone knows what a blessing is. A blessing is an expression of intention or purpose towards somebody. This, this is what a, a spiritual blessing is. So when the king blessed the entire assembly of Israel, he was invoking the power of God to enable them to grow towards their destiny and purpose. Proverbs 18 and 21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, so we must pay attention to what comes out of our mouth. Everybody wants some words of affirmation. We want it from our parents. We want it from our leaders. We even want it from our peers. Even an animal wants a word of, of, of affirmation. They, they, a dog wants to know that you appreciate him and that you love him. It's one of those five love languages. A word of encouragement, or in this case, can be given a person or to people to encourage them to reach for the stars or to accomplish God's given destiny for their life. Solomon, in his effort to unite the people, didn't beat them down with harsh and mean words. Just as he built the temple, he's also building the people up with the blessing and brothers and sisters we need to be built up too we need to build each other up every opportunity we get we need to build people up not tear them down from the pulpit not tear them down in our teachings uh, on teaching platform or in our business sessions leaders we need to build the people up encourage them and bless them in front of their peers so that they may also be encouraged to accomplish their god-given purpose Military leadership taught me this here, that a leader should never stand before his troop and take all the honor and praise. 
A leader always sidesteps praise. He he wants to bestow honor on uh, 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 his his soldiers, his 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 subordinates. So as a leader, we always sidestep that and make sure that we can reflect it back on our troops. A good leader will always direct his honor and praise to their soldiers. I found that he, when a leader hoards or puts themselves to get all the glory and, all, and the praise, they overshadow those who are behind them, those who are underneath them. And when you overshadow them, you make them hide in the shadows because all the attention, all the sunlight is on you and not them. But as a leader, we give credit to those under, under us. So the followers are more likely <clears throat> to support and follow. If you are an effective leader, others will know it, and you don't have to go out there and put your stuff out there. People are gonna know if you're an effective leader, and when they know it, you don't need to take the credit for, so you can always use that time to build up your team. So we, did, we as church leaders should all, and must always keep this in mind. We are nothing without those who God has blessed us with to follow us as we follow him. Solomon's action should be a lesson to us leaders. He blesses the people. And as we look in the scripture, there's a specific way the Lord desires it to be done. So his blessing would be on the people. If you would, turn with me to number 6, 22, uh, 22 through 26. Again, Numbers 6, 22 to 26 and it reads and the lord spake unto moses saying speak unto aaron and his sons saying on this wise ye shall bless the children of israel saying unto them the lord bless thee and keep thee the lord make his face shine upon thee and gracious unto thee the lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace and they shall put my name upon the children of israel and i will bless them in this text we see that there is a specific way to bless a specific a blessing to be said and finally god's name his stamp of approval must be said on it his name must be associated with the blessing we see this and can get confirmation from this in second samuel 6 and 18 when David had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. This verse says, all the congregation of Israel stood. Why did they stand? We stand to receive or to give honor or reverence. So the people stood ready to receive the king's blessing and also in honor of him and reverence to the divine uh, God whose presence was was manifested in that cloud. Notice in this in the observation, when addressing the Lord in verse 13, Solomon and the people must have been showing God honor by kneeling with their face to the ground. Because it says here they stood what was no, and the reason I say that, there's nowhere for them to sit. If anybody has seen the, uh, the temple, there's no place for anybody to sit. So standing was a custom in the land during that time. And if we remember in Exodus 3 and, and 6, when Moses went to see the burning bush and came into the presence of God, Moses had to kneel. He had to hide his face. He hid his face by kneeling down. This was showing reverence that something greater than myself has entered into the area. I'm in the presence of something bigger than I am. I'm in the presence of of an almighty God. I say all that to say this, we can speak with our mouths, but we also speak with our bodies as well. Our actions sometimes speak louder than words. And how our body is positioned during worship and praise could be an indicator to the Lord and others of really how we are or are not reverencing God. Just food for thought, my brothers and sisters, we need to pay attention that our outside uh, voice can be spoken through our bodies. The next thing I would like for you to notice is Solomon turns his attention now to God. In his speech, he's now finna go in and address God. If we remember last week in verse 13, it was God 
who he spoke of first, then he turned to the people. Now it's back on God. I bring this up because the dedication of the temple was God-centered, not Solemn-centered. And Solomon as a leader kept the attention on God and not himself. Our Sunday worship should be God-centered and not centered on other things or people. We see the spirit of distraction constantly in worship service and people are always looking for themselves or, or trying to get uh, attention on the actions they are doing, trying to get that attention from that. We must make sure that our Sunday worship is all about God. Solemn speech, again, which I believe stated in verse uh, started again in verse 12, shows us that we enter the church. We should immediately begin to reverence God. Verse 15 shows Solomon blesses the Lord. He begins the blessing by addressing God with the extended title, the Lord God of Israel. We can learn much from this title. <clears throat> first, the Lord, first, the word Lord is in all caps, meaning it, is in, it, it, it signifies God's Hebrew name, Yahweh. This is the name God revealed to Moses and is translated, I am that I am in Exodus 3 and 14. We find God's attributes from this name. First, God is eternal. Next, he's unchanging. This is powerful to a Christian. And it was probably powerful when Solomon spoke this Hebrew name of God to the people to acknowledge to them that God is being the eternal God who is unchanging. I am that I am. This is why God has so many titles. He's whatever we need. Glory to be to God for being whatever I need because sometimes I need a doctor in the sick room. Sometimes I need a lawyer in the courtroom. Sometimes I need a way made out of no way. Sometimes I need a provider. Sometimes I need a shield. Sometimes I need righteousness. Sometimes I need a shepherd. God is whatever we need. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. All praise and glory and honor and blessing should be ascribed to our Lord, who had once again shown himself to Israel in a covenant way by taking up residence among them in the temple, and he filled the place with his glory. How do you bless our God? Do you bless him uh, in means of praise and exaltation and worship? This is how we bless God. We bless him through praise. We bless him as we exalt his holy name. We bless him as we worship him. To bless God simply means to praise him or to honor his name. The Hebrew word translate bless in the Old Testament literally means to kneel, indicating the idea of honoring the Lord. Blessing God just demonstrates an appropriate response to his greatness and his love for us. We should bless uh, from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, David says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Here Solomon speaks a blessing for God as many as of the Psalms have done in the past. And he's trying to demonstrate to the nations that we need to be honoring God for his greatness, his love, and the and probable, uh, his honor because of his presence being among, amongst us. Wouldn't that be a thing today if we would just bless the Lord and God would bless us with his presence, bless us with, 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 with the, uh, the power of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We need to bless the Lord just like they blessed the Lord back then. We should still be blessing the Lord even till this day. We should be careful, like I said again, to bless the Lord in our service as well as in our homes. He is worthy of the praise. Solomon says, which speaks, which speaks with his mouth unto David, my father, and half his hands fulfilled it, saying, God has a faithful track record for making good on his promises. He made to his people. God, God has made good on every promise he has made to his people. When God makes a promise, that promise is fulfilled. We can take that promise to the bank. Pro the problem sometimes arise when we as people do not complete our portion in order to reap the benefit of the promises of God. 
Why do I say that? Many promises of God are, con are conditional. In that they require something on our part before God would do a mighty work on his part. Let me explain. An example of this of a conditional promise is found in 2 Chronicles 7 and 14. It reads, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. God's part of the promise is to hear from heaven forgive sins and heal the land the people's part of the promise is to be humble pray seek god's face and turn from sin and we're wondering why our land wondering why our homes wondering why our families wondering why our bodies are in the state that they are because we are not doing our part we're not humble we're not praying we're not seeking God's face and we're not turning from sin. When this is done, God will fulfill his portion of the promise. That's why it's so important to know God's promises and to give God back his word through prayer. Lord, you said, mess not with my anointed and do my prophet no harm. Father God, I'm your anointed. I am your prophet. I am your mouthpiece. And Father God, I, the enemies are trying to attack me on every side. But you have given me a promise that you will never leave me nor forsake me. This is what we need to be doing. We need to be praying back God's promises to him. First King 20, first Kings uh, 8 and 20 reads, And the Lord had performed his word that he spake. And I am risen up in the room of David, my father, and sit on the throne of Israel. As the Lord promised and have built a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. In Solomon's speech, he references David concerning him building the temple. <coughs> he says, I have risen up in the room of David, my father, and sit at the throne of Israel as the Lord promised. Solomon succeeded his father in as king of the kingdom. And we're going to get more into that in a second. He says, I have built a house for the name of the Lord thy God of Israel. He was able to keep to the task of building the temple. Now it's finished, and thus the promise to David was, was uh, punctually fulfilled, that he should have a son that will succeed him in the throne and build a house of the Lord. Solomon goes back in and demonstrates to the people as he prays to God, as he speaks to God, that God is a promise keeper. God fulfilled and did what he said he will do. Solomon's speech will now show us uh, in his good intentions. In 1 Kings 8, 16 through 18. 1 Kings 16 through 18. It says, since the day that I brought forth my people out of Egypt, I chose no city out of all the tribes of Israel to build a house. That my name may be therein, but I chose David to be over my people Israel. And it was in the heart of David, my father, to build a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. The Lord said unto David, my father, where it was in thine heart to build a house unto my name, thou didst well that it was in thine heart. Some may wonder, why God would single out a chosen city, a chosen nation, and a chosen leader. We may look at this as an act of unfair favoritism for God to select just one city, just one nation, or just one leader. But we know we know Israel was to be the light bearer to lead uh, everyone else to a relationship with God. We know God. As it says in Romans 2 and 11, Romans 2 and 11, God does not show favoritism. In Matthew 5, 45, in that B portion, we see even more dismissal of favoritism. It says he causes his, his son to rise on the evil and the good and send rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Look at it this way. <clears throat> God used these temporary resting places the, 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 for the ark in Gilgal, Shiloh, and Karath of Jerome 
as the and, and these kings who were appointed for a specific time and then removed, everything was done for a reason and for a season. While the truth of God remains constant forever, the season of God are altered to comply with God's will and his way. This season in the life of worship in Israel called for one fixed place. It calls for the temple to be in a fixed place for God to be glorified. Because the way things played out, we know we have a sanctuary now in us. He resides in us as believers. He is in his place. He's in his holy or most holy. If we are knowing and realizing that our bodies are the temple of God and we must keep our bodies holy unto God. Notice here in the text, it says God chose David. There's something to be said that God should choose the leader. Why? Jeremiah 3 and 15, God says to the people, in verse 15, it says, and I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. The reason we need to allow the spirit of God to guide us in the process is because the leader God gives has a specific purpose. They are to feed us with knowledge and understanding, and they are not placed there to entertain us. 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4, 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4 says, The time will come when people will not bear with wholesome teaching, but will gather teachers to themselves to tell them what their itchy ears like to hear. People will turn their ears away from the truth and will listen to myth. They will listen to the entertaining things that make them feel good about themselves. So when God gives us leaders, their purpose, notice this in my brothers and sisters, their purpose is to bring knowledge and understanding. But when we choose and we don't allow God to be included in the process, we don't choose leaders for wholesome teaching, not for knowledge and understanding of the word of God or the insight God wants to share with the people. We choose for itchy ears. We choose because we want to be entertained. We choose for popularity. We choose because we want people to come to, to the church. And that may not be God's plan. People become uneasy hearing the truth. They, they don't want to hear the truth because the truth hurts. And they want to hear something soothing and distracting. God's truth is to be preached by faithful teaching preachers. But people ears, like I say, itch for someone else who will tell them what they want to hear or tell it in a way that it doesn't feel like it hurts their feelings. God did not want Israel to have a king, but when they insisted on having a king like the nations around them, he gave them Saul. God was not pleased with Saul because they did, Saul did not obey the commandments of God. He did what he thought was right or what he wanted versus being obedient to God. So as a result, God sought out David to rule over his people. He chose David as we, as he was a man after God's own heart. We must be careful to get men after God's heart. So they will remain obedient to the Lord versus obedient to their own agendas. God was pleased with David and God was with him as the ruler of Israel. My brothers and sisters, if I can get serious for a moment, it's important that we align ourselves with men of God who have a heart for God and not a heart for themselves. Amen. Verse 17 says it was in David's heart to build a temple. Now, his heart was in the right place, but uh, to, to, uh, his heart was in the right place to build the temple and, and, and that he wanted to dedicate it to the name of the Lord. However, regardless of how pure our intentions may be or how noble our plans are, the will of God always, my brothers and sisters, it always supersedes the intentions of humanity. Humanity is limited in perspective. And we are only able to see the small picture that stands before us. God, the creator, is able to see 
the end before creating the beginning. And therefore, he knows what's best for us, what's best for the situation, what's best for the organization. God always knows what's best. My pastor like to say, he knows how many apples are in one seed. <laughs> to God be the glory. Isaiah 55 and 8. Uh, and nine Isaiah 55 verse 8 and 9 expressed this truth. He said, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways uh, uh, your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. We need to realize God is at a different level than we are, and he knows what's best. <laughs> God plans a, a, a way always trumps our good intentions. It's the best way I can, if I can sum that verse up right there, God's plans always trumps our good intentions. Next, we'll see Solomon's speech as he injects the promise made and the promise kept. In 1 Kings 8, 19 through 21, verse 19 says, Nevertheless, thou shalt not build a house, but thy son that shall come forth out of thy loins, he shall build a house unto my name. And the Lord hath performed his word that he spoke. And I am, I am risen up in the room of David, my father, and sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised, and have built a house for his name of the Lord God of Israel. And I have set therefore a place for the ark. Wherein is the covenant of the Lord, which he made with our father when he brought them out of Egypt. This, it, it is in the heart and the mind of God for a man of peace to construct his temple. It, 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 if you look at the house of prayer today should be a person who does not have a contrite or a harsh, evil, uh, abrasive spirit. It should be a man who is a man of peace to stand and be over God's house of prayer. Even though God dearly loved David, God also was demonstrating being God, a God of order. Because as we said last week, David was a man of war and bloodshed, thus was deemed unsuitable to lead in the construction of such a holy place for God. David could not build a temple, but he set his heart on seeing, ensuring his son would be successful. So what did David do? David started out by acquiring material that his son would need in order to make this magnificent dwelling place for God a huge success. Let's read. David said to Solomon, 1 Chronicles 22, 14 through 16. 1 Chronicles 22, verses 14 through 16. He says, I have taken great pains to provide for the temple of the Lord a hundred thousand talents of gold, a million talents of silver, quantities of bronze and iron too great to be weighed, and wood and stone, and ye may add to them. You have many workers, stone cutters, masons, carpenters, as well as those skilled in every kind of work in gold and silver, bronze and iron, craftsmen beyond number. Now begin the work, and the Lord be with you. Whenever God's plan conflicts with our plan, we can safely be assured that our way was wrong, or at least inadequate or inappropriate for that particular season. Rather than resisting God's plan or regretting the outcome was exactly what David uh, did not do. David shows us that even though it didn't go the way he wanted to go, he's still playing. The best approach, again, is when we go through that, David could have got mad, upset, and, and, and began to decline and fall off. David knew the significance of this here moment. And he, he, he teaches us an approach that we need to go in and do as well. We need to thank God for knowing what's best for our lives. We need to thank God that because he's willing to cooperate and, and he's wise at, uh, enough to know that if we do something, it's not going to turn out the way he intends. We should thank God for closing doors that we were not meant to cross. We should thank him for closing doors that we were not meant to cross. 
Verse 20, in Solomon's speech says, I have risen up in the room of my father David. We know Absalom was David's oldest son who actually sought out to be king and probably rightfully should have been king. But Solomon never asked for the throne. He never asked to be king. He, like David, was chosen. He was chosen for this purpose. He was a man of peace. Solomon was chosen by David to be king. He was he was not even aware of this until he heard Nathan calling his name out as king. Solomon was not arrogant. He knew it was the Lord's love for David that put him into the position that he was in. He spoke of himself as being as a little child in wisdom to lead the people. God miraculously endowed him with wisdom more than any other man of his time. God placed in the mind and heart of Solomon the ability to build the kingdom. When we do it God's way, it works out in all ways to honor and glorify God. So like I say, in this verse, Solomon included in his speech that God will keep his promises. God is a promise keeper. God's faithfulness in keeping promises promises is important because this quality or this reliability in God triggers a response of, for us to trust and be secure in the promises he has made. Whenever someone makes a promise and they are not kept, this causes feelings of hurt and disappointment. You think about it. When you someone make a promise to you that they're going to do this, that, or the other, that there brings about some hurt feeling and a sense of disappointment. I'm a, I'm a firm believer. Do what you say you're going to do. If you say you're going to do it, I need you to do it. I need you to get up and do what you say you're going to do because I have banked on it and I have put in that uh, thought or plan around you doing what you said you're going to do. Have you ever seen someone get mad at God when he didn't uh, do what he they thought he promised that he would do? When they didn't receive what they expected, they got mad with God. It's important always to remember to trust the heart of God, even when we cannot trace the hand of God. There is an old hymnal, we'll understand better by and by. Boy, that's still relevant today for anyone who has ever not understood what God was doing in this season of their life. There's another part to that uh, uh, hymn that goes down, I think around the third uh, verse. It says, trials dark on every hand, and we cannot understand all the ways that God would lead us to the blessed promised land. But he guides us with his eye and we'll follow it till we die. For we'll understand it better by and by. This lets us know we can have complete trust, complete confidence in an unquestionable, reliable and almighty God. You can trust the promises of God because he will do what he said he will do. Amen. In verse 21, Solomon closes his speech for our lesson today with a reflection on the past again. We know that the ark represents the physical manifestation of God's presence on the tablets of the uh, of the covenant, which is the, uh, the Ten Commandments, were written. These were the conditions of God's covenant with his people. The concept of the covenant represents God's will as manifested through the, his requirements as well as God's promises when those requirements are met. Solomon's speech reminds them of where they have come from. It should remind us as well just where God has brought us from. We've come, my brothers and sisters, a mighty long way. The, we, we know that Mount Sinai, as you go back and reflect where they came from, Mount Sinai was a site for the confirmation of the covenant between God and Israel. The process of covenant confirmation involved the following stages. Listen to me on this here, please. The first thing that involved God's love for the people was established and God was made known as the, the deliverer who would guide and protect Israel. It also, uh, number two, said God made it known that the promises of deliverance were based on obedience to the covenant with consequences for disobedience. 
And that's one of the things that we, we, we fell short of. We lose sight of that the promises of God's covenant, which means to protect and provide are based on our obedience. Our part of the covenant is to remain loyal and obedient, but there are consequences for disobedience. Moses, again, like I said, at that time was confirmed as God's meditator, his leader uh, of the people. And we know today that we have pastors and prophets who serve as type of mediators or interceding uh, to God on our behalf. Even though the barrier has been torn, the people can now access the presence of God for themselves. And, and, and as we go in this last one, the people were expected, and I need you to listen to this here. The people were expected to consecrate themselves in anticipation of God's response to them. We are to be holy as God is holy. This simply means to be set apart for God's use. Solomon's speech reminds them here as he brings up the covenant here in the speech and the ark in his final resting place that the people are to be set apart for God and God alone. This was a great lesson, my brothers and sisters, uh, looking at the speech of Solomon, looking at the words that Solomon put forth and brought out and dissecting parts of it to kind of get a deeper understanding. Let, let's now begin with the life application. How can we apply some of these principles in, 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 to our lives? The first thing we, we learned that leadership should bless the people. Our lesson is demonstrates a great king blessing the people. Blessing the people invokes the power of God. Again, to enable people to encourage them to grow uh, in their purpose, grow in their work, to have a zeal to want to do better for God. We also learned that we should bless God as well. We bless him through our praise and honor him. We honor God through obedience. We should show reverence for him sincerely when we honor him. Number three. We learn the power of allowing God to choose for us. When God chooses, it's in accordance to his divine will. But when we choose, it's in accordance to our selfishness. We also learn uh, because we purpose something in our heart for God may not be the will of God for our lives. David had purpose in his heart, but his purpose didn't align with God's plan, nor his will at that time. We must not get mad at God when we want to do something. It doesn't work out and just and we should if, if it doesn't work out, we shouldn't just want to quit and just give our hands up, throw our hands up. David taught us something. He taught us that uh, us if, if it's not meant for us to do a thing and God has it, it for our lineage, for someone else down the line, we should begin the, to procure, to get the things that will make them successful. And too many times today, my brother and sister, when it's not when we want to do something and God won't let it go through and we know it's it's for someone else, we'll throw a monkey wrench in it. We'll get mad and the selfishness will come out. And God is saying what we should be doing, we should be preparing. We should be going in procuring the things needed to allow God to get the glory in the end and also to help the person that God has ordained to do the work. And finally, we learn through uh, uh, Solomon's speech that God is a covenant keeper. If we said God, if God said he'll do it, then we need to put complete trust that God will do what he said he would do. The caveat we learned to this is we must do our part as well. Too many times we expect God to do his part and we don't do ours. Well, my brothers and sisters, that ends this week's uh, lesson. Uh, I have enjoyed it. I really have enjoyed going in and sharing the word of God, which I pray, oh Lord, that this has been a, a mighty blessing unto you. And if it has, I, I invite you just to go in and subscribe to the channel and click the bell. If it does, that way you'll be always identified. Anytime we put something out, anytime we, we bring something forth, you'll be able to get it. But if you don't, just know. Same time, same channel. Next week, same time, same channel. Our next lesson will go out again. Until then, my brothers and sisters, you be blessed. And may the Lord keep you. May he watch over you. May he bring peace, joy, love into your life. Until we meet again, in Jesus' name we say, amen, amen, amen. Good night.